Good morning, and welcome to the very first edition of the OpenStack Now podcast sponsored by Mirantis. I'm Nick Chase, and this is my co-host, John Janeshig. Uh The purpose of these podcasts is to give you a lightning quick look at the OpenStack News of the Week, and also to get your opinions and commentary, which you can send to podcast at openstacknow.com. So, uh, John, what are we going to talk about today? Well, we have a lot of stories this week, but the two we're going to focus on, uh, Cisco held its uh, Cisco Live user conference. Uh, this week, they made a couple of announcements, uh, enhancements to Cisco ACI, uh, and a, a very interesting uh, announcement that uh, that we thought about quite a lot about something they call InterCloud Marketplace. Um, we're also going to talk about Mesosphere, uh, which has come up with uh, a, a very compelling demo video of their DCOS data center operating system product. Okay. So tell us about uh, tell us about InterCloud. Okay, so uh, before I start, just a quick reminder that, of course, the opinions expressed on this broadcast are entirely our own and not necessarily those of Mirantis. Um, so this week, uh, Cisco introduced some enhancements to his intercloud fabric, which is their network of OpenStack clouds. And the idea is to make it possible to move workloads between clouds from different providers and still keep, keep things like security policies intact. So um, what they've done to create the Cisco intercloud marketplace is they've recruited 35 or 40 ISVs such as Cloudera and Hortonworks and MongoDB. Um, and uh, basically the InterCloud Marketplace is going to be their version of the OpenStack App Catalog, which was announced at the OpenStack Summit last month in Vancouver. Uh, the catalog had lists applications that you can easily install into an OpenStack cloud using Murano. And I think their idea here is to provide applications that you can easily install into InterCloud. Now, we don't exactly know how that's going to work, uh, but it will be available towards uh, later this year. Uh, basically, they're trying to show the utility of the intercloud by showing what you can do with it and what it's good for. And uh, they're trying to stimulate developer interest through their DevNet program. And the main thrusts are developer platforms such as Cloud Foundry and OpenShift and Kubernetes, as well as uh, big data and analytics and the Internet of Everything uh, cloud services, which everyone else in the world calls the Internet of Things. Uh, they've also got some other improvements, uh, such as better firewall control and, again, some additional support for ACI networking, uh, including the ability to uh, program switches and uh, the addition of group-based policy for OpenStack Neutron. Uh, basically, they're banking on enlarging the size of the networking marketplace so that even if their particular share declines or uh, their share of the hardware market declines, and they can still grow. They're focusing on the software market and programming of switches. And it sounds like uh, they're acknowledging, and uh, I guess I sort of believe this too, that uh, ISVs have a very important place in the development of uh, hybrid cloud standards. Uh, absolutely. I, I think that that is pretty much uh, undisputed. I, I think uh, actually our our head of the company, Adrian INL, said it best probably last year at OpenStack SV, uh, which is um, developers are the tip of the spear basically you know so without something useful to do it, companies are not going to adopt it so, so moving on um, mesosphere which is uh, which is uh, uh, Apache uh, mesos um, uh, has come up with a uh, with a fascinating uh, and uh, compelling video demo of their DCOS product um, which is not an open source product but rides on top of open source, uh, Mesos and uh, other open source components. Um, DCOS, and I do recommend that you see this video, which is linked in the blog post, uh, is a uh, is short for data center operating system, and what it appears to be is a highly fluent web interface to um, to Mesos. Uh, at the moment, Mesos running uh, primarily on Amazon. Um, but uh, potentially uh, and soon, they say, in uh, enterprise uh, precincts on any other infrastructure as a service fabric. The DCOS interface uh, is, um, is truly beautiful. Um, it incorporates uh, a, uh, a command line interface directly in, into the, into the web-based uh, uh, the, the, the web um, product. 
Uh, so it offers a nice combination of graphic user interface, um, uh, ability to visualize uh, cluster function and application uh, function, and the ability to give terse commands to the system. Um, and what it is doing is, um, is uh, rapidly installing uh, apps from catalogs in containerized form and uh, doing what Mesos does, which is, uh, which is um, uh, to combine all of the, uh, all of the available uh, resources of hardware into one big, uh, uh, one big uh, uh, cloud, one big abstract set of nodes. Um, it's an extremely interesting product. I'm not sure where it exists in the continuum or stack of things associated with OpenStack beyond uh, uh, beyond the obvious, which is to suggest that uh, it, it could run on top of OpenStack as infrastructure. Do you know anything more about it, Nick? Um, I, what I know is that the, the enterprise version of what they installed does run on OpenStack, and I know that um, some of their customers are currently running it on OpenStack. I mean, the, let's face it, if Mesosphere is going to manage infrastructure, there has to be infrastructure for it to manage. So um, it, it it might as well be OpenStack. Uh, the CEO, Florian Liebert, um, one of our reporters, Jody Smith, had a conversation with him, and he basically described the two as complementary. Um, so I, I think that you have a situation where, again, it's like containers and OpenStack. How do they relate? Well, you got to run your container somewhere. <laughs> So, um, and I think that that's kind of where we where we put them together. Uh, in any case, I do recommend that you look at this video. It is uh, extremely compelling, and uh, and the company uh, has uh, posted a blog uh, explaining uh, how it was uh, it was produced, uh, the requirements list, uh, and how these requirements were answered. Uh, that is a sort of a testament to good marketing thinking. It's a it's a very nice piece of work. <laughs> Excellent. All right. And, and marketing is not a dirty word. If nobody knows what you're doing, did you really do it? So uh, anyway, so uh, those are the two big stories of the week. Um, some other things going on. Uh, Chinese company Alibaba is moving into the U.S. to challenge Amazon Web Services. Uh, IBM has opened up a, um, a service, an OpenStack-based service. Uh, coincidentally also in China, called SuperVessel to enable developers to uh, get their hands on power, uh, open power resources without having to actually own open power resources. Uh, and also the, uh, and also the OpenStack Foundation has now begun a diversity committee, uh, or they're putting together a diversity committee to increase the diversity of the OpenStack uh, ecosystem and uh, community, uh, which dovetails nicely with uh, Intel Capital saying that they're going to spend $125 million uh, investing in uh, Minority run women, women and minority on business. women and my minority underrepresented uh, underrepresented uh, minority businesses. So if you want the full stories, uh, go to uh, openstacknow.com. Uh, if you want to subscribe to the newsletter so that you get all of this in your mailbox every week, go to subscribe.openstacknow.com, and we will take care of you. Um, all right, so that is the news of the week, and now we walk uh, quickly to our first guest, which is Sumit Singh, the CEO of AppFormix, uh, which, again, came out of stealth this week, and uh, let's go on and talk to him. See you in a minute. All right, so uh, today's interviewee is going to be uh, Sumit Singh, who has uh, consented to join us for this inaugural podcast. Uh, Sumit is the CEO of AppFormix, which has just come out of stealth uh, with a uh, hefty investment uh, from the VC world. And we are very glad to have you here today. He is also uh, the winner of the MIT TR35 Award and the Cisco Winnovation Challenge and... He is also, uh, this is not his first company. Uh, he has already had at least one successful exit. So uh, in addition to talking about AppFormix, uh, we'll be interested to talk about uh, what it's like to be sort of in that world. So good morning, Sumit. It's very good to, uh, it's very good to have you here. Good morning, Nick. Happy to be here. All right, thank you so much. So before we even start, let's kind of level set everything. Tell us about AppFormix. 
So AppComix is, um, I mean, we are a new startup just emerging from Stealth. Um, what we do is we build software solutions to provide you with real-time control and monitoring of your hybrid cloud infrastructure. So in, in the context of OpenStack, what we make visible to you is essentially, you know, you have your OpenStack cluster, you, you've been operating it. What we, what we make available to you is real-time metrics on how the workloads that are running on your, you know, on, on your OpenStack deployment, how those workloads are consuming the resources on, on your, in your clusters, in your data center. So it's, it's very real time. It's designed to help you identify and root cause all of the problems, all of the bottlenecks that may be occurring in your infrastructure. What kind of bottlenecks do you typically see? So the, the software solution that we've built essentially sits at the intersection of the applications and the infrastructure. And what we are monitoring is all of the system resources, CPU, memory, IO, both disk and network. And essentially what, you know, being, being at this point where we are at the intersection of the applications and the infrastructure, what we are able to do is identify where in the stack the problem is, whether the problem is due to, let's say, the network being oversubscribed or whether the CPU is oversubscribed. Sometimes uh, you may just spin up too many VMs on a server. At other times, it could be that within the VM, the application is, the, is what's not performing. Whatever that cause may be, we want to be able to help you identify it and identify it in real time. So, I'm sorry, go ahead, John. Uh, I, I was just gonna ask, when you say, um, it lives at the at the intersection of the application and the um, and and the infrastructure. What exactly do you mean in the context of an OpenStack cluster? So uh, you know, let me let me talk you through the experience of using our software. So it's it's an agent that you deploy on your host. So every host, every compute host on on your OpenStack environment, and then as soon as you install these agents, we auto detect. You know, we can automatically identify your entire environment, how many servers there are, how many VMs that are there, that are running, the tenants, the projects, how things kind of split up between um, all of your resources. And then being, you know, explaining about like, so being at the intersection of application infrastructure, what we mean is, so you, you have now all these servers in your, in your cluster. And what OpenStack is, it enables this multi-tenant environment where in an enterprise, you have so many users and now they need resources, as in they need VMs. So you, they come to you and you start spinning up these virtual machines for all of your tenants and they spin up somewhere on the cluster. You don't know where. And other VMs, they're sharing resources with other VMs. And fundamentally what's happening is we have some number of servers that are being shared by all of the virtual machines that are spinning up in our clusters, right? So being, what we are trying to then do is, if within these VMs you have app, you're running different workloads, as in your tenants are running different workloads. Somebody may be running a web server, somebody may be running a database server, somebody may be running both, somebody may actually be running Hadoop jobs. So being at that intersection, by, by that what we mean is that Whatever application or services the user is running, we are then able to automatically identify those applications in your environment. So we can tell you that, hey, these, this, is just, this is the server. These are the virtual machines that, that are running on this server. This is how each one of those virtual machines is consuming resources on this server. And these are the services that are running within the virtual machine. And this is what the footprint of each of those service services looks like on the infrastructure. So for example, there's, there's a web server running and it's consuming some amount of disk IO, some amount of network IO, some amount of CPU. We want to be able to identify that. You may be spinning up containers, you may be doing many different things. So we want to make visible to you that entire stack. You know, what's, what's, the, what's the server, what's the VM, what's the service that's running within the VM. And we do all of this using a single agent that's installed in the host. We actually don't touch the VMs or the applications that are. So you them. don't have to instrument the guest OS. Absolutely not, and that's one of the key key things that we've been going for at AppFormix. Uh, it's it's a solution that's built for the IT administrator. Um, 
the administrator has access to the host. The guest belongs to your tenant. They can, you know, spin anything up in there. So our footprint is on the host. Um, and from that single agent, we want to be able to identify how the resources are being consumed on the server by the different workloads that are running on the server. And and are you also um, uh, talking to the um, to the APIs, or is this, you know, entirely a a, a, a niche instrumentation on the Nova Compute node? It's so we we use the Nova APIs to discover um, what your OpenStack cluster looks like, as in, you know, who are the tenants, what are the projects, what are the servers, what are the VMs. And we essentially become a listener then on, on, the, on the message bus. And any times, any change or any new thing that's happened, whatever is happening on your OpenStack cluster, we are aware of it and we are reacting to it in real time. So in that sense, we are integrated into, into OpenStack, as in we, we know everything that that's currently, we know the state that's currently running, and as that right. state is changing, our state is changing as well. But listening on the message bus seems much more efficient, as well as offering a simplified deployment potentially over the alternative, which would be trying to correlate what the agent is capturing and what REST calls to the API are bringing back. I mean, there would be a definite sync, potential sync problem that you'd have to resolve there, wouldn't there be? With the, by listening on the message bus? Uh, no, if you were if you were oh, yeah, absolutely. taking periodic rest calls to the yeah 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 team. that that would just not scale I I yeah I that I think the message bus architecture is is designed much better so yeah. it's always better to go with the the well designed architecture yeah <laughs> wow that's really impressive and so the reason again the the reason for the way we've integrated is really because uh, what we did was build core technology. OpenStack is the is the first ecosystem we integrated with. I really believe in this, the whole movement and and the and the direction it's headed in. But our solution then is also integrated with Kubernetes, so you could be orchestrating Docker containers uh, and not VMs, and it would work just the same. And that's the reason why we kind of decided to, um, you know, use the APIs to discover and then hook onto the message bus to to keep the states. Uh, you know, to learn about whatever state changes that were happening and make sure that, you know, we were always in sync. So why did, why did you kind of latch onto this idea of, of a hybrid environment? I mean, why not just pick, you know, OpenStack or Kubernetes or, you know, AWS or whatever? I mean, what makes you feel like this hybrid environment is so important? So it, it, we are really following the business and our customers. Right, it's uh, and that's what they want. Um, it's it. Eventually, we're all trying, trying to achieve. Uh, let's say we, we we are running workloads. We are trying to achieve some results with the workloads. For some workloads, VMs are better. For other workloads, containers are better. And that's what we see. That I mean, we have customers, the same customers who use both VMs and containers for for different purposes. So, I do believe that. That that mixed environment is where the future is. You know, 20 years ago it used to be all bare metal, and then virtualization came along, and then now we are at this point where it's like 20% bare metal, 80% virtualized. Now containers are coming along, and we're saying, hey, these are even more efficient than VMs. So I figure in the future a percentage of you know those VMs kind of maybe migrate to just pure containers. I mean, we we'll see how it breaks out, but each each technology has a space. We still have bare metal servers as well. It's not that they've gone away. And that's how we've designed a solution. It works on bare metal, it works in virtualized environments, and it works with containers. And that's what the goal is. Okay. So now you have, uh, so you're clearly following the business world. And speaking of the business world, let's talk about, um, so you have venture funding. You just you just uh, announced a seven million dollar uh, Series A round, correct? That's correct. Okay, great. So uh, now you you've already had one successful exit. So what is it like to kind of live in this VC world? But, so it's uh, it's about uh, for me it's about chasing dreams. It's about believing in. Believing in something and going out there and achieving it. 
And uh, many times you you find that uh, you like you you have an idea, you, you want to work on it, you're passionate about it, but it's not it's it's not always the case that the business world has caught up and they see it as <laughs> you know an, an idea that they want to invest in. So being in the in, in the VC world is really about finding you know some number of investors who who also believe in the vision who who also want to say hey yeah that i believe in that and let's let's get started let's get working on it but then both me as a founder and you know everybody understands that you have to adapt you have to adapt to changing market conditions right when we when i started raising for appformix at that time uh, like docker was not even on the horizon when you know when we started but right after we started uh, it started picking up steam and you know we and we talked to customers and it was picking getting traction there too and our, i mean the way we designed our technology it was meant to be universal anyway it was core technology but then we very quickly adapted and realized that hey these these are the ecosystems to focus on so initially when we started we were going to focus on vmware a lot more but then with docker coming along we kind of de-emphasized that we said okay let's focus on the emerging ecosystems let's focus on you know openstack let's let's focus on on docker and you know so it it, it i think it's worked out well for us um, you know we were just at the summit in vancouver the response was absolutely phenomenal and uh, you know it, it's it's worked out well for us that's great. Okay. Well, good luck. Uh, good luck with this. Now, you are. I mean, you are a smart guy. You have uh, twenty. You have more than twenty patents to your to your name. You are the inventor on more than twenty patents, um, and you also uh, you you worked on uh, worm recognition. I assume you are not speaking of wor- of earthworms, but rather you yeah. know computer worms. <laughs> yes. So, uh, what is it? What is it about this kind of thing that excites you? That makes you so passionate? So, uh, it it's about telling a story. It comes back to what you believe in, right? And and you believe in something, you go after it, and you you want to tell that story, um, you know, to the world. And hopefully, while you're doing that, you want to make a difference and you want to achieve something. So talking about talking about the worm fingerprinting, it's uh, that was that was my PhD thesis. Uh, it started off as something fairly small, uh, and then you know from there I actually built the system. We deployed the system on campus at UCSD, and while that system was deployed, there was a worm outbreak, and it worked. <laughs> I mean, we actually saw it. We figured out all the hosts that were infected by it. So it, it was pretty cool. And then from that came came the startup later. And it, the startup actually, again, even in that case, became a, a lot, a whole lot more than just about fingerprinting worms because fingerprinting worms was one application of what the technology was that we were working on, which was essentially being able to in, introspect, use streaming algorithms, use randomized algor- algorithms, and being able to detect patterns in in streams of events, right? Just streams, like the going, the, especially when you kind of look at networks, the data rates, you know, they used to be like in megabits per second, now they're in multi gigabits per second. And the technology that we made really was designed to run at multi gigabit speeds and detect patterns in, in real time. So when we were acquired into Cisco, we really, you know, took, Used what we had as a platform and built a bigger system around it. So it was a great experience. But so and then go ahead. It, it sounds like the architecture of Appformix, you know, uses if not the same intellectual property, then 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 certainly sort of intellectual shared DNA from your experience in pattern matching at high speeds, the way it sits on a message bus and uh, and communicates with uh, and, and and figures out what's going on inside an OpenStack cluster. That's uh, you know. So yeah, it's interesting, but at at that time, um, the architecture was more like what Nick mentioned, which was API calls, and it was hard to keep things in sync. Now we are more uh, more in this world of message buses, which are very high speed, and it's things actually work now. 
whereas in the past uh, you could detect the things but then being able to take you know doing the work after the detection used to take a lot of time let's just say and um, even even in that old in that solution that we had designed previously there were um, because we had applied it to security um, you have to be very thorough you know when for security applications and uh, there were some cent you know there were some pieces that were central like central points like the central brains of of the solution what we've done at appformix is essentially built an entirely distributed solution uh, you know as i was telling you it's it's an agent that sits on on the compute node that compute node is completely autonomous right once you've told it what to do it can keep doing it like on its own it doesn't need to check with any any central anything central it's just autonomous it works on its own and uh, that's how you get to the you know the the infinite scale i would say right make everything smart enough to work on its own right and that's what we are trying to achieve here we want to be able to scale to clusters that are you know thousands to hundreds of thousands of node eventually currently our deployments with our early customers you know sit between 40 to 100 nodes but we we want to design to work at high scales as well right so um what do you think uh are the strongest well i shouldn't say that um what do you think you ha you have a post on your website the secrets of a of a great company what do you think is the strongest thing about appformix right now as a company the the strongest thing is the team we've put together and i mean it's you can have the best ideas but if you don't have the right team the ideas don't go very far so really the strongest team is the thing is the team we've put together it's the culture we have in place Uh, it's everybody believing in the in the shared mission it's everybody believing that hey yes we are going to build this piece of software that's going to be installed in every single data center <laughs> and it's we are all on the same mission so that's that's what's key it it takes time to get that in place uh, but i think we've achieved it and uh, now we're building on it we're you know adding we're growing pretty fast now we're adding at least a, a person a month initially we were very cautious because uh it's a uh, culture is very important like how the team was shaping up and we didn't want uh, any overlap but now uh you know the all of us who who've been here for a while we've matured now we're adding more people you know growing the team around us so getting the team right getting the right culture in place to you know go out solve the problem that that was super important and where we transition to from that was really having the central customer focus right like we we are in front of customers customers are telling us this is what we need and we want to get that in front of customers quickly that's that's what our focus is right we especially considering like the kind of space we are in we want to let's say our message is we want to do operations optimization right so the goal being that hey you've deployed your cluster you put it in production it's running and you have problems in your cluster and you don't even have visibility into them right so it happens so many times we get in front of customers we, we we've gotten this our solution to a point where it's very quick to install if you have open stack running we can potentially get in there and if you have a 30 40 node cluster we are in and out within 30 minutes it's the, the installation process is fully automated using ansible and uh it's 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 quick now we've done it a few times and uh you know it's 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 very quick and very smooth now so and they look at it and they're like i want this other view and i want this other thing and could you add this thing to the api and that's where we want to be now we want to be in this place where we are innovating fast innovating along you know collaborating along with our customers and whatever those those needs are that they have we want to be able to deliver to them you know all of those very quickly are there things that you think uh openstack should do that it's not doing so uh op openstack is uh become very big And <laughs> that's true I mean, right like it's i mean as openstack 
it's become very big as a community it's become very big and uh, it's sometimes you just want to get things done and get them out and in big big communities it's it's hard um i mean i i really like the way the community works but sometimes you just want to get things done quickly so it, it i mean i always believe that there is always um, let's just say that there are there are there are capabilities that are core capabilities and then there are capabilities that are value add capabilities right and if somehow open stack can uh, make it possible to have to have let's say to make it easier for people to do the value add um for example we are doing all we are doing a monitoring solution uh, we have some elements of control as well but um we we want to go in help our customers help them to be able to run their clusters more efficiently right that's what our goal is and uh if we work at the speed of what the open stack community works at and you know imagine we are in front of a customer a customer says hey it would be great if i could have you know this view i want to i want my customer to have that view potentially you know within a, a few weeks maybe even sooner right if if it if it's quick for me to do i i even want to give it to them the next day right, right. and that level of innovation uh with you know with you want to be close to the customer it's it's almost like that last mile kind of thing <laughs> that that it, the community like the open stack needs to make it easier for people like us to interface with that last mile customer and get that customer the value add that they need quickly how do you think they can do that um by i would say by focusing on a smaller set of things that are core and saying these things are not core we leave these out we leave these from you know we, yeah leave those out of the core focus on what is core and what is not core don't keep expanding the core because at some point it makes the core unreliable as well so now have you are you familiar with the def core initiative right now yeah i was having a conversation uh, last week and i the same thing was mentioned like def core and i've started looking at it absolutely okay yeah cuz it seems like they're doing that yeah. <laughs> yeah, like... it, i think it's needed it's uh, that because uh, but then that's what should that's what the mainstream should be is what i'm saying it should not be a sub initiative that's kind of saying hey these things are core and let's but what i'm saying is what the primary function of open stack should be is to make the core and let you know companies that are interfacing with their customers innovate more rapidly rather than have some project in as part of open stack that kind of works but really doesn't kind of work you know is it's kind of neglected and sometimes uh you know is is not it's it's not the best thing is what i would say okay now uh is app formix contributing to the code base so we we are looking for opportunities to contribute uh i mean several developers here to contribute to open to open stack you know to different projects in there we are looking at actively participating in both the monitoring and the uh, you know the the congress work um and just at the summit in vancouver we you know we tried to uh participate in in all of those design sessions and as time progresses we will contribute more and more wherever there is opportunity for us to to contribute we will contribute okay john did you have uh, other questions no no makes sense congratulations it sounds like uh it's a really exciting time for your company and uh we're looking forward to to seeing what depformis can do on test clusters and things like that the production let's let's talk <laughs> production now i think let's let's move beyond test let's i mean let's our test about. clusters but yes <laughs> our production clusters as well we are actually uh, currently running on uh some clusters that have been set up by marantis and those customers are using them in production excellent so last question and then we'll let you go uh so we know where openstack is now we know what you're doing now um with your sort of pattern mindset what do you think is coming next coming next yes so i to me it's uh 
it's the 80-20 problem, let's say, or the 90-10 problem. I, I believe we are getting to that point where lots of OpenStack clusters are going to start going into production, right, at scale. Right. And I, I believe that, you know, one or two key standouts have been established who are going to be taking the companies there. You know, Melantis being one of them, perhaps uh, just going to the cloud being the other, you know. So we... I think we've established that, yes, this thing can work. It does work. People have tested it out. Several people are already using, using it in production at large scales, and I think even more and more people are going to start using them in production. I do believe this, this whole problem of, or this whole space of how do I now keep my cluster running in the most efficient way? Right? I think it's a, sep it's a separate problem from getting the cluster up and running. I don't think they're the same problem. Right? Many times people say, hey, this OpenStack thing is not reliable. I don't think that's true at all. I think what it is, is we need to have best practices in how do we operate this cluster, right? How, if, how do we identify while it's running that there is a problem, right? Clearly, you can't just put something out there and assume everything will just run perfectly fine, right? Even I, nothing runs perfectly fine. It's all software. Right. So, we, I think where we need to, and where as of AppFormix we're investing, and I believe there'll be others as well, is how, how do I efficiently run my cluster? How do I identify when things are not running? How quickly do I identify them? When I've identified a problem, how, how quickly can I fix it? You know, that's, that's going to be one big space. The other big space is, is going to be this whole thing of self-service IT, right? I mean, in a lot of organizations, the reasons... Uh, like folks went to, you know, places like Amazon was because they could just give their credit card and instantly they had a VM and they didn't have to ask anyone. I think in within the enterprise, the enterprise IT will start to become more like that. It will become more self-service to the users in, in the enterprise. And I think OpenStack has the potential to play a big part in that, you know, mostly because the way it's designed, it's designed with open APIs. Right, and what that means is that the enterprises can actually take what's there and build their systems around those APIs and and get get you know eventually get to that goal of having uh, this self service IT, and that's that's another space we are looking to play in as well. You know, it's uh, give empower your you know all of your employees to you know spin up these VMs, monitor these VMs, make sure they're running properly. If they're not, then give them the means to fix that, give them the APIs that, you know, even the the application owners, the the infrastructure APIs, right, and the, give them to the application owners so that they can use them, consume them in their applications. When things are not working, they should know instantly that they're not working, and they need to potentially design their applications in a better way as well. Just like today we design our applications in the cloud. We, we assume that the cloud is unreliable, <laughs> Right, so we design yes. for around that within our application. So I think where we will end up is this going to be this kind of uh, coming together of the two worlds, where in the enterprise, just because it's infrastructure controlled by the enterprise, I think the what we will do is we will make the as in the enterprise we will make the infrastructure more reliable, of course, but. We will also give all of the APIs to the to the application owners so that they can work around whatever bottlenecks there may be in the infrastructure and make their applications more reliable that way, you know, built using the newer templates. So I'm actually very excited about what's in store. All the conversations we've been having with uh, with 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 the early adopters of OpenStack, uh, they they are truly visionary and they they really believe in all of these new ways of working and operating. So it's, it's really cool. Excellent. Well, well thank you, Sumit. Um, we really appreciate it, and uh, we wish you the best of luck, and uh, you know, come back and talk to us in, in a few months and let us know how things are going. Absolutely. Thank you, Nick. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.